Is autotune ruining music? Today we're going to talk about it. This is a wildly polarizing topic and uh, people are pretty set in their ways, but today we're going to take a very pragmatic approach to discussing autotune quantization and its effect on modern music and its effect on music as a whole. By the end of this video, you'll have a better understanding of how these programs work and how we got to where we are and why things are the way they are musically. Let's get into it. Now, a week or so ago, Rick Beato made a video, and let me let me just stop real quick, because I have a massive amount of respect for Rick Beato. I think he's an extremely talented person, ripping guitar player, very experienced in the music industry. He has a YouTube channel that's 30 or 40 times the size of mine. I have massive respect for Rick. So in no way is this video aimed at him, and I feel like I had to clarify that, because that video was had a million views on it, and so I knew someone would draw the comparison here. Uh, I've actually been Facebook friends with Rick since he had like a 100,000 subscribers, so this is not a dig at Rick or his video, let's just get that out of the way, but I watched that video, and it it made me think about some things, and I really, it, it did force me to analyze my own perspective on this issue, especially being someone who works on top 40 music, and I'm, I'm pocketing and tuning vocals all the time, and I'm quantizing drums all the time, and it really made me take a look at what I do and my process and music as a whole, the current state of music as a whole. And so I just wanna share my thoughts with you on that. And I hope that this will help some of you understand why the music today is the way that it is and how you can play within these parameters, but also stay super creative with your music. Before we get into it, I just wanna give a huge shout out to Sweetwater. Thank you, Sweetwater, for sponsoring today's video. I buy all my gear from Sweetwater and have for many, many years, and I fully trust them and their sales engineers, and they have some of the most knowledgeable staff on planet Earth and some of the most helpful staff on planet Earth. You can buy anything that you would ever need from Sweetwater. There's links in the description below for pretty much every piece of gear you see behind me and every piece of gear I ever talk about in these videos. And if you use those links, I get just a tiny bit of a commission. Really helps the channel out and it really allows me to spend a lot more time making videos just like this and other tutorial educational style content. So get down there and use those links for any musical gear that you might never need, never need? that you might ever need from Sweetwater. <laughs> Thank you, Sweetwater, for sponsoring this video. Okay, so let's let's take a step back in history for a second. So for, for all of history, we have praised musicians that were technically proficient, that were a, a cut above, a step beyond the average in terms of technical proficiency. With singers like Freddie Mercury, who had incredible timing and incredible pitch. There's there's a bunch of videos here on YouTube about Freddie Mercury being having all those harmonies for Bohemian Rhapsody planned out in his head before he started recording it. And he sang all of them. There's a fantastic video with Brian May uh, pulling up the multi-tracks of Freddie singing all the acapella vocal stacks. And it's, it's mind blowing. I mean, we praised people like that. He was extremely extraordinary and we praised him for that. Drummers like Neil Peart, who was at the time on a, just another level of technical proficiency, we, we praised him for that. Guitarists like Chet Adkins or Eddie Van Halen, like they these musicians were people that came along. Every once in a while throughout history, someone would come along and they would kind of change the game. This is now what's possible for a human to do on a technical level. Uh, and doing so while being extraordinarily creative, and this was a good thing. Now this trend has never stopped and we still continue to strive per for perfection as humans. Even myself, I worked on 168 songs in 2021. I probably played guitar on somewhere around 100 of them and I wanted to be as technically proficient as I possible, as I possibly could, as, as flawless as I could possibly make my guitar playing, that was my goal. And so I think the trend has been for all of musical history for people to want to be more and more technically proficient. So let's let's start there. That's that's kind of the foundation for what I want to talk about today. So in 1989, Pro Tools came along. And this is the first time that you really got to like 
cut up instruments and and shift them around timing wise and have little or no effect on the sonic characteristics of them. And then further down the line in 1997, autotune was invented. Now, yes, I think autotune ruined vocals for many, many years. <laughs> I'm personally not a fan of the of the shared do you believe in love or the T-Pain. I'm personally not a fan of like hard tuned vocals. So don't take this as that's the perspective I'm coming from. I'm not a fan of that stuff, but I do respect it as a creative decision. But I think what's more important than autotune in 1997 is when Melodyne came around in the year 2000. Now, Melodyne today is the most widely used tuning program uh, for music production. Just about everyone uses Melodyne to tune their vocals, and inside Melodyne, at least the current versions, you can also pocket the vocal, so you can change the timing of the vocal, you can also control the sibilance, you can take out breaths, you can do all sorts of stuff inside Melodyne. It's an absolutely wonderful and extremely advanced program. Now, I never used those earliest versions of Melodyne, so I can't speak to what it was like in the beginning, but I can speak to what it is like now. And the interesting thing about Melodyne is, you scan a vocal into it and it does absolutely nothing to it on its own. You are the one that makes the creative decision to decide what to do with each syllable and each note of that vocal inside of Melodyne. It will make none of those decisions for you. So what this means to me is this is a 100% personal creative choice on what to do with that vocal inside of Melodyne. This creative decision of what to do with a vocal is no different than how much gain to use on a guitar track or what octave to play that synthesizer part. This is a truly creative decision that you, the producer, or whoever is tuning the vocal has complete control over because Melodyne won't do anything on its own. It only does what you tell it to. Now, I have used this theory that I have in most of my music production for more than a decade now. So I believe that flat and late is relaxing or lazy feeling. And I believe that sharp and early creates anticipation or creates energy. So I was just tuning a vocal yesterday with Melodyne in which I only tuned every fifth or sixth or maybe seventh word. The singer was absolutely great and it didn't need much, but you know, every like one word in every line or a couple notes in every line needed a little tweaking. And so I would tweak those notes. But I also, inside of that song that I was tuning, I specifically was conscious to scoop vocals. There's multiple times throughout the song where there was a build going into a chorus or going into a solo or the climax of the song at the end of the song. And what I did was I purposely scooted those vocals just a little bit early, the tiniest bit early, and left them just a little bit sharp. And if the singer didn't sing them sharp, I purposely pitched them a little bit sharp. And what this did is this created a whole bunch of energy, a whole bunch of anticipation for the climax of this song. And it actually enhanced the emotional characteristics of the song. So what the point I'm trying to make here at first, and then we're gonna to get to a whole bunch more stuff, is just because someone is tuning a vocal doesn't mean they're taking the life out of the vocal. In fact, arguably, if you're tuning a vocal the right way, the good way, right is subjective. I shouldn't have even said right because this is all a creative endeavor. But if you're, the way that I will tune a vocal, the way that I think is the most appropriate way to tune a vocal is so you enhance the emotional character, the emotional integrity, the emotional content of the song. And you have total control over this because Melodyne doesn't do anything for you. So you can push those notes a little bit sharp if you want. In the same way that if you were doing a very Frank Sinatra-y kind of tune, you could pull some of those notes just a little bit flat. The tiniest bit flat would be more appropriate for a style of music like that. You have total control over the emotional context of the song when you're doing this. That doesn't mean that everyone uses it that way, so I'm not trying to say that people don't absolutely ruin music with autotune, with Melodyne, because that it absolutely happens. You can absolutely destroy the emotion in a vocal if you tune something too hard. Now, as far as quantization and drums, the same thing is exactly true. So just because I might quantize a part of every single song doesn't mean that I'm ruining the emotion. Arguably, I'm enhancing the emotion. For instance, on a very organic type of song, I will commonly only quantize the beginning of the sections of the song. So 
the first downbeat, the one of the verse that gets snapped to the grid. The very first downbeat of the chorus gets snapped to the grid, of the bridge gets snapped to the grid. And so all I'm doing is make, lining things up so that way there's more impact. It's more aggressive when these things hit because everything is locked together tighter, but it's doing absolutely nothing to take away from the groove of the music, from the humanness of the music. And so that's that's the most simplistic way I can put this, but you have total control over how much you quantize something. You could quantize every the beginning of every section of a song like I just described. You could only quantize whole notes, which might not do anything or very little to to hinder the vibe, the groove of the drummer. You could quantize quarter notes eighth notes, 64th notes, and obviously the further down this path you go, the less human everything is becoming. And so yes, you absolutely have the potential to take the humanness out of it, but you also, if you use these tools in what I believe is the correct way, you have the ability to actually make things just better objectively better without dehumanizing it whatsoever. And again, all of this is a creative choice that you or whoever is working on the music is making the decision on. So it's interesting to me that since a drummer's job, his primary objective is to keep time for the band, that we would ever demonize a piece of music for wanting to keep better time time. That's a very interesting thing to me. I'm happy to look at it as a creative choice that some people might like and dislike, but saying that they shouldn't do it is very interesting to me because also there is no right and wrong in art. And what we're doing here in music is art. And it's ultimately up to you what you want that art to look like, or I guess in this case, sound like. Now, all of these things are obviously a spectrum. For instance, the high school band playing at the talent show, likely the drummer doesn't keep very good time and likely the singer doesn't sing in very good pitch. These things are not that pleasant to listen to. I'm making huge generalizations here, but I wanna paint this picture for you. You go to your, your kid's high school, there's a band playing, super pumped, they might be super talented for their age group or they might be doing really cool things. Doesn't mean that they don't have room to grow. They likely have lots of room to grow. And they are also likely not going to be successful at this moment in time. They're likely not going to get millions of streams, which brings me to my next point. 60,000 songs a day get uploaded to Spotify. 60,000. That's an enormous amount of music every single day that gets uploaded to Spotify. Now, you'd have to be crazy to think that all 60,000 of those songs per day are perfectly quantized in tune. Now, it's hard to say what ratio of this has no tuning and no quantization, but certain, I would say 10,000 songs a day. There's got to be 10,000 songs a day that are uploaded to Spotify that have no quantization and no tuning whatsoever. And probably a huge number of them were actually done on tape because that's such a, a big fad at the moment to do everything truly organically to tape. Now, the interesting thing to me is that means that there's no shortage of truly organic music out there for you to consume, for anyone to consume and find. However, generally speaking, again, these are mass generalizations, that is, that's not usually the most popular music. There's some outliers like Foo Fighters who are obviously absolutely enormous, enormously successful and popular who use little or no quantization and tuning. But generally speaking, the, the music that is to some degree quantized and tuned, that has been touched in some small way, is the most successful music, which leads me to think that as the general consumer, the general consumer leans towards things, is generally more attracted to music that has been quantized and tuned, and I have a theory for this. So things that are not the, let me back up. So the more tuned something is, the more tuned a piece of music is, and the more quantized it is, the less dissonance that music has. This is an objective fact. This is not something that anybody can, can debate. The more perfectly in tune something is, the less dissonance it has. And I think that the general population more enjoys music with less dissonance. And I think that music that is not in any way tuned or quantized has less of a chance of being successful because, yes, you could argue that we've been conditioned 
to hear this. You could argue that record labels and, and the big streaming platforms are shoving this ultra polished music down our throats. There's arguments for all of this. However, 60,000 songs a day, there is plenty of music that is truly organic and not quantized or tuned for people to absorb. They, that music just has a much, much, much smaller audience, even if that audience might actually be more tasteful. <laughs> So, should we quantize and tune everything to death? Should we auto-tune every vocal? Well, of, of course the answer is no. Uh, that's a ridiculous thing to say. What I think you should do, what I think all of us should do, if you're a, a person involved in music production whatsoever watching this, here's what I think we should do, and here's what I strive to do. What I strive to do is identify the appropriate amount of quantization and tuning for every song on a song by song basis. Sometimes I'm working on a pop tune that, that is hard quantized and hard tuned, maybe not T-Pain tuned, but like pretty hard tuned because that's what's appropriate for that song and that genre. Simultaneously, the vocal I was tuning just yesterday is a very organic Chris Stapleton type of music and it felt super weird to tune hardly any of it. So all I did was tune the minute notes, the tiny notes or the tiny words, the, the, the every five or six or seven words that I touched with tuning and that actually enhanced the emotion of the song. It took the, it made sure that the notes that the singer was just a tiny bit sharper flat on, it didn't take the, the listener out of the vibe of the song when those bad notes or slightly off notes happened. And also, I purposely would push things sharp or flat when it was appropriate for the emotion of the song. And so that's what I want you to take away from this if you're watching this, is what is the emotion of the song? What's the vibe of the song? And what is the appropriate amount of quantization and tuning for that one particular song? Because sometimes it's nothing at all. And sometimes it's super quantized and super tuned and it's your job to know the difference and to do what's appropriate for the song and appropriate for the genre and paint the artist in the best light. Because that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to present music in the best light possible. We're trying to shine the best spotlight on this music as we possibly can. And what that means is sometimes tuning things, sometimes tuning things purposely sharp. So approach this on a song by song basis and, and follow what's right for the emotion of the song. Don't do something just because you think it should be done. Don't quantize something and don't tune something just because you think it should be done. But also don't leave it alone just because you wanna be super organic and it's screw auto-tune. Like that's also not an appropriate response. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you, Sweetwater, for sponsoring this video. Hit the links in the description below. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like in-depth tutorial style content, don't forget to check out my Patreon where I do tons of mixed tutorials, tons of music business advice. Links in the description for my Patreon. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.